the scriptural intro. Yeah. Are, are we yeah, ready to Brad's go? Brad's remote oh, too, on? so you know. We're on. Oh, Brad. good. All righty. Ready to go. Okay. Oh. We would like to call to order the me meeting of the Harwich Conservation Commission for February 16th, 2022. Uh, this meeting is once again hybrid. You can participate either in person or by phone. It looks like most of the participants tonight are on, on the phone. So we welcome to everyone. Uh, we have a number of items on the agenda tonight. Uh, we'll try to get to them as expediently as we can. The first item is a request for a determination of applicability from the Eastward companies for zero Route 39, uh, zero Route 39 Orleans Road, map 63, parcel C3. This is a continuation of a, I think two, this is the third meeting we're having on this. Uh, it's a request to make a determination of delineation for wetlands on the property. Do we have a proponent here tonight? Uh, David Clark here from Clark Engineering. Can you hear me okay? David Clark, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, hold on. Yeah, hold on, we're having a hard time. We're having some technical difficulties here. We'll be with you in just a moment. David, we can hear you on a uh, go-to-meeting. I can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay, we should be good now, I think. Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Great. All right, thank you. Uh, David Clark on behalf of Eastward Companies. Um, you should be in receipt of the revised plan uh, that shows the um, the new two or three new wetland flags. Um, and I think that's all the commission was waiting for. rendered um, under the Wetlands Protection Act in the future. Um, also, we did receive a letter from the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program that this, pro this pro property sorry, is within habitat for eastern box turtle, and therefore, before any work starts, whether it's within a 100-foot buffer zone of a wetland or not, any work on the property, that a box turtle protection plan needs to be submitted and approved by the Division of Fish and Wildlife um, they gave the applicant a template for that plan. Um, our approval is not contingent upon that, but I would request um, that we are also furnished with a copy of that plan, as well as um, NHESP's responses to that, and the alterations that you have to do to it. Um, I would also recommend that the Conservation Commission requires a vernal pool study um, as part of their determination part of their decision to write a letter stating that a vernal pool study is to be completed by a wetlands expert in the spring of 2022. Thank, thank you, Amy. Um, questions from the commissioners? Let's start with Jim. No questions. No, no questions. No questions. John, are you on? Do you have a questions? I have no questions. Thank you. All right. 
right, thank you. Mark, any questions? No questions, thank you. Okay, uh, and Alan? I uh, no questions. All right, and I have no questions either. It looks, I'm sorry, Brad, are you on? Yeah, Ernie, I, 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 I have no comments. And just to let you know, my uh, microphone's not working, so I'm calling you by phone as well. All right. Okay, thanks, Brad. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so with that, can we, are there any questions from the audience? Hearing none, then, can we have a motion? I will move that uh, we approve uh, the and subject to a vernal pool study being completed in the spring of 2022. Okay. And the box turtle plan submission. Uh, I thought that wasn't going to be a requirement, Amy. That we be copied. Okay, that. that we be, and then also add that we be copied on a box turtle protection study. Okay. Hey, Brad. If you could mute your computer sound, that would be helpful because we're getting a little feedback between the phone and the computer. So I see your, your mic is muted on your computer, but... Okay, I think we're good. Do we have a second on the motion? Sorry. John, Mark, Allen, or Brad, can we get a second, please? John's trying to speak. The entire motion because it was a, uh, a ear splitting feedback while Jim was making the motion. If it could be repeated, that would be helpful. Thank okay, you. I, I'll make the motion again. I'll move that the commission approve the determination, a determinate or make a determination that the area depicted on the proposed plans is the area subject to the protection of the Massachusetts Water Protection Act uh, with a positive 2A determination and subject to a vernal pool study being completed in the spring of 2022, and that the commission be uh, forwarded the results of a box turtle protection plan. Thank you. Now, can we get a second, please? I'll, I'll second. Thank you, John. All right, let's do a roll call All in favor, Mark. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Alan? Aye. Aye. John? John? I'm catching my... Brad? Aye. Aye. And I'm a favor. Jim? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is a notice of intent for two Millers Toll Road. Uh, this, again, is a follow-up conversation to a... Uh, presentation that we had last meeting. Do we have a proponent on the phone? I'm um, Tom Stone from TS Land Survey. Um, this is a continuation from the last meeting. And there are some objections to the variance that we're asking for within the no disturb zone. So as a result, we have um, removed our request for a variance and reduced the length of the building by two and a half feet. You should have revised plans that we submitted. Um, basically, this pulls the building outside the no disturb zone. A portion of the steps would still be within it, but there would be no more increase in site coverage within the zero to 50. We have also added a proposed patio within the 50 to 100 foot buffer, but there's also no increase in site coverage or just keeping at a net zero effect. If you have any questions, we have to answer them. Okay, Amy. They kind of went back and looked what the commission asked them to look at, which is no increase in square footage of coverage in the zero to 50, which they did. 
there's overall a net reduction of three square feet anyways um, within the entire buffer zone. So they're not provide, um, required um, or proposing to do mitigation at this point. Um, I would recommend approval of the project with the condition that roof runoff go into gutters, downspouts, and drywalls, and that no chemical application or fertilizers be used within the 100 foot buffer, and that the patio be pervious. Okay, thank you, Amy. Uh, questions from the commissioners? Let's start on the phone. Mark, do you have any qu questions, comments? I agree with Amy, thank you. Alan? No comment. John? I'm good. And Brad? And Brad. No comments. No comments. Thank you. Uh, you questions? Yeah, I just have one comment. Um, one of the things that we had uh, concerns over at the last hearing was the fact that there were stairways within the no disturb zone. And while they have reduced the amount of that, there are still stairways within the no, desert, no, desert, no desert, disturb zone. And um, I was wondering whether they had considered any alternatives to the stairs being in that area, such as we had discussed at the last hearing. Um, this is what the applicants would like to propose. Um, well, they don't want to change their floor plans at this time. Uh, we, you know, there were previously there were structures within the dose disturb zone, such as the existing building, uh, patio, and retaining walls. So we're not getting any closer than previously, or was previously existing. And this is basically how the applicants would like to propose the project at this point. I know the, um, the applicant is listening on. If he has anything to add to that, he's, you know, he can definitely, I think he's chiming in right now. Yep. Hi, this is Chris Jung here and Anita Jung as well, owners of the property at Two Millers Toll. So we we looked at the plans as, for, as we were discussing last uh, meeting. And unfortunately, the way that the plans are built right now, it would be extremely hard to change the way that the layout of the building is. And some of the room sizes and everything would completely throw off the proportions. Now, we were trying our best to minimize impact to any of the area by reusing the existing foundation, which is severely limiting us on how we can lay out the building. So the fact that we're trying to reuse the foundation and not dig uh, as much as possible is really kind of confining the way that we can keep minimum room sizes, minimum hallway sizes, and, and ultimately kind of achieve the plan that we're looking for. So we did consider what was requested last meeting, but that's why we were bringing the building back to two and a half feet, which really gets us to the point where we have room sizes that may be bordering too small at this point. So um, we did pull the building back. We are not proposing any increase uh, in the zero to 50 buffer zone. And uh, we were trying to accommodate as much as of the feedback as we can from the last meeting. Uh, no. <clears throat> um, Wayne, do you have any comments? I do not. Okay. And I have no comments either. I, I think you've, as long as your, your dimensions are um, in the footprint, essentially, of what was there previously, I, I think it's acceptable. Um, so with that, are there any other questions from the audience? Hearing none, can we have a motion, please? Sure, I'll move that we approve the notice of intent for two Millers Toll Road, map 111, parcel K3-3. Can we have a second, please? I'll second. Thank you, Mark. Uh, roll call, starting with Mark. Aye. Alan? Aye. John? Aye. Brad? Aye. Jim? Aye. Aye. And I'm an aye, so motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, the commission. <clears throat>
until somebody leaves. Next item on the agenda, notice of intent for 20 Chase Street, map four parcel N-2 is a replacement of a dock and the float. Do we have a proponent on the phone? Yes, this is Roy Okorowski with WRS Engineering representing the Doherty's for this project. Um, what we're proposing to do is replace a licensed existing pier ramp and float on the Herring River with uh, a duplicate size pier ramp and float with the exception being that we're going to raise the pier up to the preferred height over the wetland where right now it sits about two feet above the salt marsh and we're proposing to raise it up to elevation deck elevation six and also change the standard piling configuration, removing eight piles and replacing them with three mono piles. Um, therefore, we're meeting the standards of the current um, DEP recommendations for height over marsh and that we um, got some comments from the board, one of them being that um, they asked if we could remove move the float out. Um, looking at the, the usable width of the river here, if you put a boat on this float to the other side of the actual workable channel, it's only about 50 feet. So by pushing that out, we feel that would, would be a deterrent and would not be even acceptable to the harbor master and the owner has um, stated that we'd like to, to keep it where it is. We have, a, we have a buy right to do this with our license where our net improvement is we're removing basically five piles, which will naturally grow in with marsh. Um, if you look to the south, it's going to look very similar to that, that pier that was constructed there. Um, and uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, it's going to be constructed. Uh, some of the piles are going to be redriven from water. And then I think we can reach them all from the water. If some have to be from land, we're not going to be on the marsh. Per se, everything will be done from upland or the water. Um, there'd be no pressure treated wood used as specified in the project. Um, and we can answer any questions at this point on the project. All right, thank you very much. Amy. Um, so this is a replacement of an existing and in, in my view, it's an improvement over existing as um, Roy stated, instead of just two feet over um, Marsh, they're going to be at, at the lowest four feet um, at point six to seven um, to an eight feet at the seaward edge before they get to the float. Um, go, reducing the number of piles, um, increasing spacing in between the boards. And the only, um, what I had mentioned to Roy was that on the seaward edge of the float, they have over two and a half feet of water, but on the landward edge, they're less than that. Our regulations do read that it has to, a dock has to extend to a point where there's two and a half feet. Um, to me, that means the seaward edge of the float. And I did ask, though, what it would take um, to move it out. Another it would be six feet that they'd have to move it out to get two and a half feet pretty much around the whole road. And as, as Roy stated, it's kind of at a choke point in the river. They would have to go to waterways, amend their Chapter 91 license, and um, if they're going to be having their boat on the seaward edge of the float anyways, which is what they would do, um, I thought that this is a simple replacement with some benefits that that would be um, acceptable to the board. Um, <clears throat> I, I, one question I do have is, um, just to, as a precautionary measure, because it is two and a half feet-ish at the end, would you be amenable to putting float stops on the structure? Um, there, there's only two piles supporting the structure, so you, you'd have to have four piles for float stops to work. Okay. Um, or else it would just tip. So, uh, yeah. no, yeah. I don't think it would work. I figured I would ask. I think actually um, the additional two piles would probably be more detrimental than than the float um, than the benefit that the float stops would have. So, um, with those comments, uh, I would recommend approval as shown. Okay. Thank you, Amy. 
All right, comments from the commissioners? We'll start with uh, Mark. No remarks, thank you. All right, thank you. Alan? No comment. John? Uh, question. What is water float stops? So float stops are if you have, say, four piles, you actually could just, um, on the edge of the outside of the float, there would be rings that you bolted to or chains, and then they they basically look like almost like bookshelf holders that you would bolt to the piles. So they'd be coming out about a foot on the inside of the piles. It, just very similar to putting a shelf in your cabinet. So when it came, when the float came down to a certain point, it would sit on those and not be able to go any farther. So if the tide dropped all the way out, it would be in the air. If you can picture that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that makes sense. So, <clears throat> but if you have a, boat secured to whatever the piles or the float and the tide goes out so far that the float is going to go around the boat is going to go around uh, ground as well um so <clears throat> my question is um we're at two and a half feet uh at mean low water that's of course not the lowest tide do you know what mean low low water is at that location uh, mean low low water here is probably another foot, foot down or so. I would yeah. guess, you know, I know it's hard to determine here because we're so far up the river. So you can get wind events that change it. But I mean, it's, it's basically we're meeting the regulations uh, on the front of the dock. That's the way they're written. That's why we uh, are proposing to just keep it that way. So. So I have a question I, I'm more for Amy, I guess, or whoever is, it doesn't make sense. Uh, is it possible to include in the orders of conditions language like no vessel nor the stock shall be aground at any low water? Yeah. I'm not sure, you know, that's not necessarily enforceable, but at least it makes the point. We can always reiterate it. I mean, Okay, I, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Brad, comments? Yeah, my mic, sorry, my mic's not working on my um, computer. So let me um, try to make this work here. How's that? Can you guys hear me? Yep, you're fine. All right. My my only comment is on the uh, I think the depth of water, and I, I think for a very long time this commission has looked at that language, and there's no directionality to the word extent, extend to. So I I think for a long time we we really interpret that to mean you need 2.5 feet all around the structure, and I still believe that's the case and that's the intention of the language because you start to see impact when you have structures and boats that are closer in water depth. So I just want to make that point. I, I think in this case, the explanation given for not, you know, reaching that depth and given that it's a, a pre-existing structure, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I'm going to object strongly to that, but I, I do feel this commission for a very long time has viewed that regulation as having 2.5 feet at, at all sides in, in and my justification is there's no directionality around the language of extend to. So it makes sense to me from a practical standpoint that you want to protect all sides, substrate and all sides of floats. So I just want to make that point. And, and if there is in fact nothing that can be done in the existing structure, then I'm going to leave it alone. That's all. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Brad. Jimmy, no, just to comment that I think it's an improvement over what's existing today. Okay. Thank you. Wayne, do you have any questions? No, I agree with uh, Jim. It's definitely an improvement. All right, good. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one, the float itself, what kind of flotation material are you going to be using? Um, there'd probably be um, tub floats, my guess. Uh, just plastic, plastic tub floats, not foam. I, I, I guess I couldn't hear that exactly. 
Oh, so they're, they're, the, they're the polyethylene tubs yeah. that they build all the float with now? Yep. All right. I'm with you. That's fine. Um, are there any plans? I noticed the salt marsh under the existing deck walkway is, is completely degraded. There's a mention in the uh, discussion about this, the project where the, the disturbed marsh or vegetated areas are going to be revegetated. Uh, does that also include restoring, put, putting new salt marsh underneath the new walkway? Yeah, we, we'd be happy to do some plantings under there to restore that area. Um, you can condition it that way. We would have no objection. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, good. Um, under the construction protocols on page two of your narrative, it mentions that when the equipment is not being utilized, the barge shall not come in contact with the marsh at any time and not be allowed to bottom out. But I didn't see anything in here about when it is in being utilized. I assume that would apply as well, but it's not mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean that—that's the plan. You know, they're not gonna—they're not gonna sit there in the mud and drive um, piles. Um, that was the intent of the of what we're saying. So it is—it is in fact under while it's being utilized and as well it's not being utilized. All right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for that. <clears throat> and then the other question I have is. The clearance that you show is six feet at mean low water, and our regulations require. That's the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's the deck elevation at six feet. Understood, but our regulations require yeah. that you have enough space for passage underneath the deck, or else stairs to to access to cross over the deck. Um, what is the height at mean high water? So you only you have you have four feet minimum plus the joist is three feet. This um, that would be so the license that exists would specify the um, that passages exists in, in the license and I don't think the license in there um, specifies that and somebody can just walk around it. Um, so there has to be a you only have to walk, have the space under it if you can't pass by it, um, is kind of the way it works. Um, otherwise, we'd have to put stairs in the in the marsh, um, which would be prohibitive because someone would have to, because you go straight from the stairs to that little ramp to the pier. So nobody can pass, people aren't going to pass on the marsh. They'd have to pass. Um, and you know through his yard and and then they can they it doesn't really apply the way the dep regulation applies it's for a passage on i believe it's uh coastal coastal beaches and or like revetments or something so i don't see how it would really apply here where could a person pass well it, it, the the intent is for someone that's walking on the shore when they come to the dock this right. pier to be able to pass underneath it or else we'll have walkways to go over the top of it. So my question to you is. Yeah, but that's if okay. Right, that's if there's a place to walk, but there's only a marsh here. There is no walkable area. Well, I don't if think. Maybe ain't. Well, I agree. But Did you also could... say if somebody did want to walk here, they have the clearance that would be required. Do you I feel mean, that's. Not the four feet, but. Shortly thereafter, if they really wanted to walk there, they could walk under it, certainly at five to six feet. DP, or the state, I'm sorry, would say five feet is generally enough to pass under. At mean low or mean high? Or at all times? I don't remember the language. It doesn't, I don't think it's silent. It just says you have to have enough clearance to walk underneath it. And I think this one you will. You're comfortable with this? Yeah, I would much rather see people going under it, and plus it's not a highly trafficked area, than, than putting additional structures on the sides to get people up and over. It would right. be more detrimental. Okay. All right. Good. I, I guess going forward, I'd like to see, you know, when we get proposals like this, that there is some clear discussion or representation in the, in the presentation that addresses that. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's you know, it's really unclear, I think, from what we have here in front of us. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, no other comments. Any comments from the audience on this? 
Hearing none, can we have a motion, please? Okay. Um, I will move that we approve the notice of intent for 20 Chase Street, map 4, parcel N2-2 for the replacement of a dock and float. Can we have a second, please? I'll second. Thank you, Mark. Um, roll call on the phone, Mark. Discussion, please. Discussion, sure. I just, I would request a modification of the motion that it is explicit that the votes not be of styrofoam. He, he said it would be polyethylene barrels, I think, John, in response to the question. I know he said that, but it doesn't say it anywhere in the filing. I just like it to make, I, I, and I'm sure that's probably what's going to happen. I would like to make it part of the motion to make sure that it happens and there won't be any questions down the line. I have no objection to that being added to the motion. Okay, thank you. Mark, would you be comfortable with, with seconding the, the amendment? Yes, that's fine. All right. <laughs> any other comments? All right, hearing none, uh, roll call Mark. Aye. Alan. Aye. John. Aye. Brad. Aye. Aye. Jim. Aye. And I'm an aye, so the motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is Notice of intent for one salt metal lane, map 11 parcel C1 for the construction of a sloped revetment and replacement of an existing dock. Yes, this is WR as engineering representing the O'Neill's on this project. Um, and I'd just like to kind of give a little description um, of what the owners wanted to achieve here and why um, we proposed what we did, and we do understand there there is a lot of questions and comments that I tried to address, um, and we do understand all the rules and regulations stated by the state and the town. So, um, but we, we'd like to you know open up the conversation in a in a way and see where it ends up. So we're not, um, you know, we're willing to just work through a process to see what we can do here. So what, what has happened here is over the last um, number of years, there's been quite a bit of erosion um, where their dock comes out and then over on the southern part, also too, along the bank, um, due to currents and sea, a sea level rise. And basically it's, it's very similar to every other point in the Herring, Herring River that's heavily eroded and quite a few of them have already been revetted at points in time. Um, the physical difference here is that um, the water is, is, is very deep at this point right in front. Um, it's similar to one point below the bridge where the current comes in there and it just washes it out. So, you know, a very short distance from shore, you're, you have no bank or beach at, at the lower, even you know, at low tides. So um, using a fix like a fiber roll fix or vegetation fix, um, we felt wouldn't work here because um, it would just basically fall and get dragged in and, and the cost incurred would be prohibitive, would actually drag the bank down with it if it got undermined. Um, so then we looked at other alternatives, you know, just, um, straight up wall, vertical wall, which we know isn't really permittable. Um, we know there was one approved across the river recently, um, but that has a special case behind it with a public road. Um, so, and, you know, we're not really an advocate of those. I've done a few other projects slightly downstream where we, we did some rock walls and we feel they, they won't hinder the current um, type of thing and bounce waves off and everything. So, so what I proposed here was um, put in a, a rock revetment that's approximately seven, seven feet high going down into the water. But then what I proposed was to build, try to create a marsh in front of it to restore the marsh. I looked at a lot of historical photos and I went back pretty far and there was some marsh fringe here at some point, but 
I feel that if we can some way build a march in front of it, if the board thought that there was more potential for that to be a positive thing than, than the existing low tide beach, um, which from my information, uh, you're not allowed to shellfish on and there is not a whole lot of shellfish on coming from the owner. Um, so we came up with this and the way you, I proposed to build this marsh would be, uh, it came from an idea that used to be in front of the Barton residence, which is just the south where there was an old um, washed out bulkhead um, that had rotted away, but it kept a, a healthy marsh in front of that property for a, a long number of years um, until it finally went and then the marsh disappeared. So I thought of building what's called an overwash bulk, bulkhead, which would be driving basically some wooded sheeting down below um, the low water and backfilling it and planting a marsh in here. What that would do would, would create a marsh in front of the wall, which would basically mimic, you know, the natural shoreline to the north and the south and other parts of the river. Um, in terms of the, the DEP regulations, the houses are listed as post-1978. The main house was actually um, a lot older than that, but rebuilt um, in uh, about 20 years ago, I believe. And there was quite a lot of stipulations put on that. And the owner of the house did a lot of mitigation plantings and things, worked with the town in order to get that. The other structure was rebuilt is now it does exceed, you know, some of the DEP regulations of, of 60 feet from the shoreline, but that's the area where a power line comes across and there's a power pole, which is now probably about only eight or eight or nine feet from the shoreline, which was moved, um, I think about eight or 10 years ago, and they've lost about 10 feet of shoreline there. So that was one of the driving factors um, of the owners looking at their property. It is a very unique property. It's, it's basically an island. Um, so if it keeps eroding away, you know, at the current rate, we're looking at you know, some number of years before you'd actually have to move that other house. If you could move it, you can't really move it because there's a septic system there. So um, rather than wait till later, um, the owners, you know, thought we'd like to go forward and see what the town thought of, of our project. Um, the work would be done from the water on a working barge, um, basically cut the bank back, put the rocks in, then drive the, the sheeting there. You could also build a project without the sheeting in the marsh if the board thought that the coastal beach, which is a low tide beach, was more beneficial than a marsh and building a marsh would be detrimental. The other thing proposed, which we'd like to propose regardless of um, how you feel about the wall is the existing dock is eroded away at the landward edge to a point where they won't be able to get to it soon. So it would be a simple, um, not as, a, as the application says, it would be replace the dock. We don't want to replace the dock. We just want to extend it landward, I think eight feet. And that could be done with just some, some minor um, timbers put in there um, and it set back. And then the, the two last pilings in there, um, we're not sure how long those are. So those might have to be replaced with longer pilings. Um, and that, that's the project as it stands. And um, I just like to go over, um, you know, alternatives analysis. Um, Amy asked me to go on and, You know, the original one was a standard one. It just basically said fiber rolls won't work. So that's not an option. Um, vertical sheeting, we don't feel would be a viable project. We feel the town and the DP would appeal it obviously because uh, it would have a negative wave effect river. Um, so a, a marsh fronted rock revetment we felt would be the basically mimicking the shoreline that was there. It would preserve the, the upland, which is, is a habitat area. Um, it, would it would actually create marsh. Um, so there'd be, we don't really see the negative effects of it. Um, and I, I just like to open up the dialogue at this point, um, you know, in a, in a discussion way um, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Amy? Uh, a couple clarification questions first for Roy. Roy, you had mentioned about the dock that um, where the plan says to be replaced this time, but 
but you said no, it's really just ex the extension point landward. So the float, the piling, the walkway, those would all remain. Right, we weren't going to the only the last set of pilings. We're not sure how long those were. So, um, if we that to be approved, we would say we'd like to be have the ability to replace those last two pilings, and then on the very landward end, we probably only, we wouldn't put in pilings. We probably only put in like six by sixes, um, and just build like an extension landward there. A very minor project. So the the issue with the utility pole is you have to go through the utility provider, um, which can take basically you know up to a year to even get a design from them. We're worried about the length of the wire that already crosses the river. It did move it once, so there's you know you basically aren't replacing just the pole; you're replacing hundreds and hundreds of feet of of um, wire. You'll have to split out to do a splice and then. I would suggest the pole be moved, you know, 25 feet back, further back um, in writing. Okay. I was curious. And also, I mean, not really for necessarily, we don't have to figure this out tonight, but um, it looks as if where the line is coming across from North Road, it looks like there could be shorter spans and if they were to go off from different places, but I know that there's electrical easements and other things that could be involved there that could be a hindrance but um, there may be a, areas where the span could be less potentially um, maybe the utility company could be instructed to look at that that would potentially help the applicant um yeah go ahead just to keep just to keep on that one note for a point if it if it does continue to erode um you know, even like another, you know, we, we need, it's almost imminent to put that in process. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, um, you know, to get that permit. So if we have to do it, we do it because if that's not there, then there's no power to the houses. Right. Um, it, Cause they're not on generators or anything. So to my knowledge, right. Just to put that in. Well, I think, I mean, yeah, we can certainly, um, I, I agree with you that it's important to make sure we still uh, have power to the house, no matter the end result of our discussions. Um, so moving on to the, the big project here, which is the revetment with the overwash bulkhead and the marsh planting. So I had um, sent the commission and then sent Roy um, the same questions that I had sent the commission and Roy did provide a response narrative to to that. Um, I guess first, kind of an overarching theme in my mind would be the need for a little bit more study of this area. There were some references made that there's been a two foot erosion rate, that physical probes have been done. I, I'm curious where those uh, you know numbers have come from. What does the physical probe mean, who did them, um, a little bit more scientific basis for your request here. I think anybody who goes out there can see that there's been some erosion there. Um, it doesn't take a scientist to see that, but to the, um, generally when you're talking about putting up hard structures, we look at erosion rates. So being it's this far up the river, CZM doesn't have an erosion rate for that, but um, I, I would be curious in knowing how you kind of came up with, with the numbers um, and potentially monitoring this area for a little bit longer. Um, we talked about it on site today when we did an inspection about installation potentially of benchmarks to study erosion rate over the next year or two um, on the property. Um, I mean, as you stated, it's it's not a pre-78 structure. It's 60 feet away from an eroding bank. Um, so I can see, you know, long, and I understand the homeowners want to kind of get a handle on this now. But I, I do think a little bit more study needs to be done to, to back this up. Um, 
Going on to, let's see, I'll go through the comments. So one of, one of the main points in this project was that the, you don't view this bank as a sediment source to a downstream stream beach. Um, but I haven't been provided with any information for the commission proving that. Um, there is an immediate downstream beach from this. It's a tidal flat. Um, it does qualify as a coastal beach. And based on flow, it would seem like a lot of the what's eroding from this bank may be going to that area. Um, Can we address these one at a time? Sure. Wait. Sorry. Are you going to read them all? Yeah, so just in terms of that, I, I thought I supplied a, uh, an excerpt from the DEP regulations basically defining a bank for a downstream coastal beach. And this, it, the whole definition of it is not based on river bank. Um, it's based on offshore offshore banks, and if you read if you read that excerpt that I provided, or if the people have it, uh, this does not meet that criteria in any way, shape, or form. In my opinion, um, my suggestion is that we get an opinion from someone else on that point because um, you know this is this isn't protection from storm blowers. This isn't any of that. This is just a river bank. Yeah, I, I, re I do read it a little differently, but I am happy to get an opinion. We have um, a coastal processes specialist over at the county. Um, he's a coastal geologist. He's a geologist, Greg Berman. Um, happy to chat with him. He's a third party. He's no charge. Um, third party reviewer for applications such as this. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. So let me just make a note to contact Greg. So I'll forget. Um, um, so go, I was, I'm just going through the um, different resource areas, if we will, here. So land containing shellfish um, stated that it would be an improvement to the resource. I'm curious uh, how you said you relied on aerial imagery and physical probes to show that the area proposed for revetment was salt marsh, and thus you state that you don't think it's a viable shellfish habitat. Um, this area of the river is just, um, is a prohibited area for the growing of shellfish, likely to a higher bacteria count, potentially because salinity starts to decrease as you go up the river a little bit too. Um, but I am curious about what you mean by physical probes and who did them. So we basically, I went in there and pushed down through all the sediments to see what was there. You, you have basically that upper sand small layer that's just hasn't washed in yet and then right off the bank everywhere it's just this nasty muck uh, that goes to nowhere um, off of dead vegetation and you know speaking with the owners and things like that that nobody ever shellfish there they never seen any shellfish there I understand the protocol if we think that is viable I could ask the owners to get a shellfish survey um, and you know as, as normal but we didn't we didn't think that, um, you know, based on what they've said about the area that you can't even shellfish there, what's, what's the value of it? Um, I know from experience with the, the DEP, you know, creation of salt marsh is, is a much more viable, uh, you know, trade off than a, than a poor shellfish area at best. Um, but that's up to the board to decide. I mean, I would agree with you on that salt marsh is important to more interests than than coastal beach uh, or um, is um, and that this is certainly not what I would consider pristine shellfish habitat um, but again I just I wanted to bring it up because these are the standards that you know you have to meet um, I am a little concerned about I know that you're fading in the project in terms of fading the rocks um, into the slope and into the existing salt marsh. I still have a little concern about um, adverse impact where the hard structure meets really no structure. Um, only if there's not you know, routine inundation, if it's like an upper marsh area that doesn't see high velocity of the river or constant inundation. If it was that case, if it didn't, then I would be less worried about um, 
and scour impacts to um, to salt marsh, but I still have some uh, reservations about this project in that regard. Um. Yeah. yeah. So on the on the the northerly end, we tried to bring it in. There's a huge gap in there now, and we tried to bring it in to tie in. If the marsh, you know, we we'd obviously have this condition that if you did allow us to build it and put the marsh with it in there there's such a huge amount of marsh there that we'd be creating that we'd be almost 15 feet from the from the edge of the marsh to where it is so you know we don't think much would happen there on the southern end um that's a, a high erosion point also you have that little creek right after that so you know any any wave action that would come down that would almost kind of roll into that that creek entrance you might lose a little, you know, marsh in there, but we could condition it that, you know, we try to preserve, you know, keep the marsh in place. I do understand. And in that place too, the edge of the revetment is almost 20 feet from the, um, you know, where it tapers in from the, um, in the water line. But we tried to bring it back as much as we could. Okay. Um, speaking of that Southern point there, something, um, that came out of a, a, an adjacent uh, across the river properties discussion um, when we had Greg Berman, who's a coastal processy specialist, out. He was, you know, of course, we're looking at the whole area there, and he we had made note of, of this side of the river, and he was indicating that there might be the possibility that the river might be in the process of trying to straighten itself out a little bit, and like where that low area is, where you have a little bit of a channel in the marsh that potentially over time with sea level rise and other things that that might be where the river tries to, to poke through. But he and I, we can certainly, and you're welcome to join us if you're up here or if the applicants are here to join us when we talk about that on the site. But um, that would be kind of an interesting um, interesting thought that he had that might pertain to this project. Um, that would certainly change the dynamics. That's kind of that's kind of funny because it's a the, it's not an emerging coast; it's a sinking coast, and that's why all the rivers in Massachusetts are winding because the it's been sinking, you know, very slowly over geologic time. Mm -hmm. So they they do me. You know, every single coastal estuary like this, pretty much. That that's an interesting point. Yeah, he uh, he just. I mean, it's such a strong, sharp meander here. He was saying sometimes when you have really these ninety degree turns, as you start to see, sometimes he's seen the rivers start to straight, straighten themselves out a little bit. Um, but anyway, um, that's something we'll talk about when, with Greg. Um. So one thing I don't think you did address, and correct me if I'm wrong because I could have missed it, um, I had asked about the riverfront, how your project meets riverfront standards. So really anything above the mean height water line of the river, um, which would be your proposed structure, um, that would, you'd have to address riverfront or Rivers Act standards for that. So I'd like a little bit, um, you know, you to provide that in writing a little bit more elaboration on this project meeting the Rivers Act requirements. All right, yeah, we will provide that. I was really didn't understand it because I've never been asked for it before on similar projects. So I didn't really see how it would apply. Well, but I'll read it. Uh, we basically will read it, um, reply. Thanks. There is a... Um, there's a threshold for the amount of disturbance you can have in riverfront area on the lots. So, as well as the, um, especially wildlife ha and effect on wildlife habitat that coastal banks can have. Um, so those are, I guess those are my comments for now is I, I really think a little bit of additional study before we um, really go farther on this would be, would be needed. And I'm open to talking about what the parameters for that would be because as presented, I mean, it doesn't, there's a lot of things it doesn't meet. Um, I, I appreciate your wanting to 
<coughs> increased salt marsh there. Like you said, it's, it's a highly valuable um, resource type, but the, the core standards, uh, the 19, pre-1978 house, the less than 40 feet from an eroding bank, those are key things that this project doesn't, doesn't meet right now. And, and we understand that. That's why um, I, in the beginning I expressed we opened it for dialogue and discussion. There's one, I mean, the, only, the other thing, you know, there's some viable things that I'd like to submit. I, I've done some um, extensive projects for the Army Corps of Engineers down in the Gulf um, with, with natural solutions in, in kind, similar to what some of your projects have, and possibly I can present some of those. Um, in a response that might be a, um, you know, look a little different to the board and, and might be a viable solution um, and have some technical papers to back them up, et cetera, um, if, if this is a no-go. So i just like to move forward and continue um, and answer. I'll answer all the rest of your questions and then, uh, you know, we'll provide what you're asked. Okay. Um, one quick other thing um, on that line division of marine fisheries their letter um, to you had um, requested more that you vet soft solutions a little bit more and there was also some yeah. other solutions that were mentioned for a nearby project um, that are more like living shoreline type projects um, softer solutions natural solutions that we could look at like you were saying to see if they're viable options for this site I'll happily work on that with you. Yep. I mean, there's some there's some pretty neat stuff that I we, I do a lot of living shoreline work and all all kinds of work all over the country. Yep. And um, it's just a matter of you know what would be acceptable in Massachusetts is mostly the problem. All right. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for me. All right. So comments from the commissioners. Um, start, Mark. Any questions? Comments? No remarks. Thank you. Okay. Alan? No, no remarks, no comments. Okay. John? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, it seems like the most pressing problem here, um, at least from my point of view, uh, is the utilities access and, and the vulnerability of that one utility pole at the moment. So it's interesting that in light of that, there is no alternatives analysis in the proposal for what to do about the utilities. I would like to see a comprehensive analysis of alternatives. There's probably a number of different ways to get utilities in there. Um, I don't know what they are, but I think, I, I, I can't imagine the owners haven't thought about this before. And uh, I think that stuff should be presented to us before we proceed. Um, so the other thing is you mentioned historical photography and stuff of the area and uh, Amy was talking about the two foot erosion rate um, and also mentioned that it's clear to anybody who goes there that there the bank is eroding right now. Um, but if you look at the historical photos that are available, um, it doesn't appear, they're not precise, but it still doesn't appear that there has been significant long-term erosion, like two feet a year of erosion at that place would have wiped out a good, good bit of that lot, and that hasn't happened. So the question, one of the questions for us is, what is the real erosion there and what's the history about the erosion rate here? I mean, given the fact that it doesn't, the lot doesn't really comply with a number of requirements here for doing a pretty dramatic hard solution there, I think there needs to be a lot more information about the erosion rate. And looking at the historical photo, photographs is just a way of sticking your finger in the wind and see which way the wind is blowing and it doesn't favor long-term two foot a year erosion rates. Um, and the other point is, again, just historical photographs 
it's notable that if you go back eight years, um, that spit of sound, sand that is making that very sharp turn, curve in the river looks way more substantial 80 years ago than it does now. And so that sort of lends some support to the notion that the river is eventually going to break through that and straighten itself out a bit there. And I'd like to hear more about that too, as Amy said. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Brad, do you have any comments? Yeah, I have a few. I guess I appreciate the interest, you know, for discussion on options here. And it has been a good discussion, but I do agree with Amy that I, I think that this is a tall order to approve the revetment as described. Um, it, I just don't think it's um, it's the right solution for that or it's a good fit for the present regulation. So I, I do look forward to hearing other options for the site, um, but it, I, I think a revetment of that size of that type would cause impacts coastal bank um, on either side as well as salt marsh on the upstream side. But um, so anyways, look forward to seeing what you come up with. And in terms of shellfish, I, I walked the site a couple of times and, and there are oysters present. So I, I think shellfish habitat is still in play. I, I think it's something that, uh, you know, may not drive the design, but it's certainly something that, you know, if, if you can see oysters with a pretty casual visit, there's probably other species there as well. And, and so I, I do think we need more information on shellfish. If Brad, can, can I just comment on one of my ideas that I proposed to the owners was actually um, doing beach beach renourishment in those in the key points at the dock and at that area where the power pole is um, basically putting sand in there to create more beaches um, and increase you know the buffer to the bank um, in that way you know, on a yearly basis um, but I wasn't sure if that would be detrimental to to the shellfish and, and that kind of thing because we'd be burying existing beach do you have any any comments on what you think that would um, do? Yeah, that's a good question. Downstream, there's a creek where there's quite a few oysters present. And as you come upstream from that creek, you can see some oysters that are being buried right now just by natural movement of sediments coming off the bank. And so you would have to think about that. Um, but those oysters, you, you can see them being buried and, and they probably get exposed, some might die. But um, I, I think that's probably the primary species. As you go subtitled, there's probably cohogs, but I don't think they would be impacted very much. But I, I, I think um, some consideration for the oysters, particularly at that downstream creek, um, you wouldn't want to bring a lot of sediment to change that habitat or, or cover those oysters. You're talking, about the creek. Too. You're talking about the creek just on the south edge of the property right there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, any questions? Uh, no, I mean, from listening to the discussion, I think to me it's very clear that there needs to be more discussion and perhaps more studies uh, before we would even be able to take an intelligent vote on this matter. So my only question then would be how we would proceed administratively. And I think we have a few options of that. We could clearly continue this hearing, uh, but in that some of the studies may take over a year, it would be unclear as to what date we would continue the hearing to. Another option would be to allow the applicant to withdraw the application without prejudice have all these discussions and studies, and then come back to us with the results of those discussions and studies. The third would be just to you know, turn down the current proposal, but again, allow the applicant to come back with a revised proposal at a later date. So I think those are the three potential options that we might have. Okay. There if I may, yeah, there's sure. one more. Okay, Amy, go um, ahead. I knew I forgot something, no, Amy. No, fine. You actually can continue indefinitely, Indefinite. but what they would have to do, I mean, unless, I mean, it's the applicant's purview if they want to come back in two weeks or a month to talk more, that's fine. We can continue it to a date certain. 
But um, if you wanted to continue it indefinitely, the applicants would just have to re-notify a butters prior to when they wanted to come back, however long down the road. Okay, so that would be a fourth alternative. Okay. And that was all I had. Okay, good. I have a question for the engineer. If this is ever approved, where would your staging area be? Where are you going to load your barge with material, rocks and so forth? Um, I'm not the contractor, but I know um, that the other revetments that have been built um, came upstream. So the question is getting under the bridge, obviously, um, with a rig. So I would have to talk to um, some contractors about that and um, ask them how they would do it. If they might have to light load them on, on smaller, small, you know, smaller barges that could actually fit under that span. Um, but I can find that out for you. Yeah, that would have to be addressed, you know, as to where, how, where you're going to load the, you're going to have to have probably another excavator or a crane sitting there picking the rocks off a truck so you don't have to dump them on the ground or on a parking lot and load them on the barge and then move them up the river. Yeah. That should be addressed. Okay. No, I'll find out. I'll talk to a few contractors and see how they'd approach it. Okay. Is that it, Wayne? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I just had a couple of comments on this and, and some of which I just will discard because of the, uh, based on the prior comments that have already been made. <clears throat> uh, one overall comment is that it, it, it strikes me from visiting the site that this one stretch that you're proposing to put the revetment on is probably some of the principal habitat um, wildlife habitat for uh, wildlife on the island, if it, as it were, that that this um, that this will protect, and and I see that the revetment is basically destroying that habitat and access to the to the river, um, and so that's that's a troublesome fact for me. Um, the the use of the untreated timbers, I see where you're putting in that overwash wall. I mean, obviously, what's the lifespan? Do you do you calculate for those timbers? Say 15 to 20 years, and then you know, the idea is not to put a, a, what's called a bulkhead in is like if it's almost like mimicking an old wood bulkhead that um has gone, and you know, you'd be, you'd be replacing them every you know 10 to 15 years, you'd be putting in a couple new boards in to keep it there. Um, it's, it's a preventative measure. Um, obviously, you'd have to condition it to to upkeep it or else the marsh would dis disappear. The problem here is that, you know, there's this point and then there's a point past the bridge to the south, which, you know, is south of that last wall that, that put in there that just gets hit so hard with the, with the, you get a north wind and outgoing flood tide and current, and um, it's very hard to keep anything there, you know? So even if you put, you know, if you put a bulkhead there, a regular just a rock wall there, there's a chance that that rock wall would exacerbate and not get undermined. Yeah. Um, that, one of the reasons I put this in is a kind of deflector that could be repaired easily and affordably, um, you know, just by sending someone out there with a with basically a little pneumatic camera on a little barge and drop in some some wood planks. And you don't necessarily have to be all tongue and groove. You can put the new planks in front of the old ones just to keep it to keep it up, sort of like a maintaining a garden, I guess, it was my uh, envision here. Um, and it all came from an idea of some of the old ones. Uh, that's kind of the way I saw it. So it's a, it's a pretty high maintenance solution, I guess, really. Well, it, yeah, it's pretty obvious that you're not gonna permit just a wall because it doesn't meet the criteria. So if we we figured that maybe the net benefit of adding all this, you know, creating a huge amount of habitat, which is way more than most projects I see there done um, ever ever did, um, including the project for the sheeting wall that was just approved, you know, across the river where there isn't even a residence present. Um, so, but that's that's you know we understand the reason for that. We agree with with that. But you, you know the whole of this approach which is just one approach to this, which, you know, the owners wanted a rock wall. This is the only thing I saw that was even close to, to meeting some kind of positive um, as opposed to negative 
um, you know, outcome of the project. Okay. Um, turning our attention to the dock situation, um, can you tell me what's the water level around the dock? The float or the dock? The float, rather. I'm sorry. The, the float is uh, it's around four feet under it at high at uh, low tide out to the end where the boat sits. Okay, because I and also along the north side as well. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, we're just we we did some soundings there, and then we're all we're not talking about any of the the project there. But if there is an issue with that, um, you know, we're just talking about extending. We're actually talking about extending it inward, which is not part of only uh, local. It's only local because it's above mean high water. Yes, it's nothing to do with below. Yeah, well. No, the only only reason I ask the question is generally you don't see boats lying alongside the float, um, and I I just was concerned whether or not the boat would be aground in low water because you have one in your. I, I was there. Uh, yeah, I was. I was. That's actually my boat <laughs> that's sitting there um, that I did the surveys with at dead low tide, and I couldn't. I could barely reach a rod down in that outside corner to the, to take a shot. Uh, so there is some some good water there. It looks like it, drops off. it looks like it drops off fairly quickly um, from the yeah. line there. Um, so with respect to the landing, the the landward extension that you're suggesting, um, you mentioned it would be eight feet. The the plan says six, but you're you've decided to go with eight. Yeah. Um, I mean, six would be fine. The, the, where the erosion scarp is is actually out a little farther than that. Um, the main, just, just if I could mention, too, the main driving force behind this project is um, Mrs. O'Neill, who really saw, she's worked, you know, she was the one who dealt with the power pole last time, and she's seen it go from being 25 feet from the shoreline to eight feet from the shoreline, and she's worried about her dock actually on that inside edge being eroded to the point where they can't get to it. So, um, you know, it looks it looks pretty bad. So, you know, six feet um, is fine. That, that'll last them a while. Um, possibly, you know, we come back with an amendment to put fill in there um, and restore the bank. Um, so it's not straight up, you know, if we continue this, that might be an option too. So six feet is fine. Okay, because I, I would, I mean, I can see where there has been that scouring that takes place under at the end of the dock on the landward side. Um, and generally, we're, I mean, this this walkway that you're suggesting would be a new structure in the zero to 50, which we generally don't allow. Um, but I think with the surveys that we're talking about to, to see what the erosion rate is, particularly in that area of the, of the river here, um, you know, I'd like to see the results of that before we approved any sort of an extension on it. It appears you've got, what, four, four or five feet left of, of land underneath the walkway before you come to the end of that on the landward side. That, that's funny. I think, you know, one thing I can suggest, too, is we can try to get the, uh, I'm sure there's a plan or something of when they moved that pole before. Or, or some, I can pull some good historical. It's really tough to tell from the historical photos that I looked through. Um, but there's also, you know, the the verbiage from the owner of how far they moved the pole last time they moved it, et cetera. And um, we can, that'll be all part of, if they decide to go that route to get studies done, um, that information will be supplied. Okay. We, Great. Um we have the filing for when the poll previously got moved, so I can look at it too and send you some stuff. Unless they have something that oh, they nice. submit at that point. Well, I already, I already, right. I already had pulled your old file anyways. I have it actually here. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go through it and send you things that might be applicable. Okay. And um, I have no other questions. Any questions, comments from the audience? All righty, hearing none. Um, how would you like to handle this then? Um, I, I would I would like to uh, continue this indefinitely due to the time frame. I don't think there's, um, 
with even with other types of solutions, I think we need to nail down these erosion rates, um, et cetera. I suspect that it's going to take, um, if we use historical information that we can gather, it would take, you know, a month to get that. But if we actually, if the owners decide to do a study, you know, we'd be looking at a longer term and they might feel that they should just table it or um, till we can get that data. Um, I know they are very worried about the upland part of their property. Um, you know, it's, it's because it's an island, you're losing your island um, and the owner's very anxious. So um, is there a way to continue it? Can I continue it for two weeks so I have enough time to just talk to them and they might make a decision and let them make the decision because I don't have the power to do that. And then if, if we come back, would I be able, allowed to ask for an indefinite continuance if they wanted to push forward with all these studies? Yeah, Amy's saying that that's not a problem. So that would be March second. Is the next meeting. All right. Um, do you suggest we go ahead with Greg's analysis of this? Um, if you would, Roy, ask your client if it would be okay for Greg Berman and myself and whoever they want to be there, um, if they want anybody to come to the property. Um, again, Greg's a free yeah. resource. No charge to anybody. So, yeah, we we have. I they've given me permission to allow anybody on the property. Um, so that that's fine. It'd be great, great for you to go down there to have them take a look. Yep. Okay. Good. So with that, can we have a motion to uh, move this to put this on the agenda for March second? March second. Okay. I'll move to. Continue the hearing on the notice of intent for one salt meadow lane map 11 parcel CL until the meeting of March 2nd. And can we have a second, please? I'll second. Thank you, John. Roll call, Mark. Aye. Alan? Aye. John? Aye. Brad. Aye. Jim. Aye. I'm an aye, so the motion passes. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Did he say we have permission to go down there? I don't know. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So uh, the gate is take sometimes um, closed. Like if the gate's open, you can go, but if the gate's closed, just park and walk in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if anybody wants to go, well, not a quorum. I can't have a quorum of people, but if anybody wants to come out when Greg goes out with me, I'll let you know when. Okay. It's a very nice site. It is. I know the place quarters. well. Yeah. It's fabulous. It's, a, it's it's sort of fascinating, but you're right. It's an island, and you got to protect it, I guess. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, just to get their, their driveway over the creek is uh, they had to repair that uh, a year or two ago too yeah. do I they own that when they rebuilt the bridge it was gosh it almost went back in the late 50s that was quite a project yeah is that a town no private That's private yeah oh yeah all right all right next item on the agenda is order conditions for 25 bellbrook lane map 23 parcel x6 for addition of a garage and relocation of the dwelling um, this was just an amendment, so if you have any comments on the condition, the amended conditions, let me know. The, um, the only question I had was the date, the uh, expiration date has not moved on this. It doesn't. It doesn't move. Okay. Nope. That's what I, that's kind of what I figured. So the only real change to the language that we've already approved is the amended special conditions. Mm -hmm. There's four items at the end of it. Yep. And the new, new plan of record. Yep. Okay. I don't have any issue with that can we have them or right. any comments questions from the commissioners now can we have a motion please on this sure um, I'll move that we uh, uh, approve the amended order of conditions for 25 Bell Brook Lane map 23 parcel x6 I'll second that all in favor uh, starting with mark all right Alan? Aye. John? Aye. Brad? Aye. 
Uh, Jim? Aye. I'm an aye, so motion passes. Can I have two volunteers from commissioners who are remote to come in tomorrow or Friday to sign a couple of things because we only have, we need four signatures and we only have two uh, physically present people who can do it. Does anybody have uh, time Thursday or Friday to come sign documents? You're gonna be in all day? No, but you can, we, you can <laughs> arrange a time. Can you just leave them at, with Melissa? Yeah, we could, we could probably leave them with Elaine. Okay. In planning. I can if you want. That'd be great, Mark. I can come in. Thank you. I will, if Melissa or I aren't here, we'll leave them with uh, the planning department, okay? Yep. Thanks. Amy, this is Brad. If um, I'm, I'm off the Cape all day tomorrow, but if you need me, just send me a text. I can come in Friday. All right. We'll let you know. Like I said, I just need I have these two here, Jim and, and, and Ernie, and I just need two more. So first come, first serve. Okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. And then we have three out of the four in our Dropbox. Yep, Melissa's been cranking away. Yeah, she's doing a great job. Um, let's start with uh, May 19th. Anyone have any questions or comments? I had two comments on my copy, Amy, that I'll just give to you. Okay. Anything substantive the group needs to know about? Uh, no, it was just there was a uh, one word on the first, you know, third page. Was project was should have an S on it, okay. <clears throat> and then uh, on the fourth page, down at the bottom, was, was mentioned it was 90 feet from the BWM. I thought you might have meant BMW. Actually, no, it's BWM. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. <clears throat> All right, very good. Other than that, then you have, anybody have any other comments on this? All right, let's look at the next one is November 3rd. Uh, okay, go ahead, sorry. And I didn't have that on my agenda, on my site summary, but I could have copied it wrong. Do you want my copy? No, no, good. Oh. I have a copy of oh, it. Okay. It's just not on my list, but it's okay. Yeah, it's on the agenda, November 3rd, 2021. Okay. Um, on the first page down at the bottom, it's it, is mentioned under H C way about putting in a trench drain, and I thought that was probably a French drain. Yes. In a leach but it pit. It could be a trench anyway. It is a trench. Either way. Oh, is it? Okay. Either way. Whatever you. Trench. Whatever you're good with. Just bring it out. Okay. Um, and then there was one other one, and for the life of me, now I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Um, Oh, uh, it's a, just a typo on page three, uh, one, two, three, fourth, par third paragraph down at the end of the paragraph, third line from the bottom of that paragraph. It says there, that would be there, T-H-E-I-R. You're gonna give me those two? I will give you those. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments on that? All right. Uh, moving then to November 17th. Um, the only kind of one change on this under the first determination of applicability, the fourth line down it, toward the end, it talks about a contiguous buffer to the creek, C-R-E-E-K. Okay. That's the only one. That's easy. And John, we got yours and made um, what it was wording changes too. So can we have a motion to approve the minutes of May 19th, November 3rd, and November 17th of 2021? Okay, I will move that uh, we approve the minutes for the meetings of May 19th, 2021, November 3rd, 2021, and November 17th, 2021. Thank you. Well, I'll second that. Uh, roll call agenda, uh, or approval rather, Mark. Aye. Alan? Aye. John? Aye. Brad? Aye. Jim? Aye. And I'm an aye, so the minutes pass. <clears throat> Last item on the agenda, discussion and possible vote for, oh, I'm sorry, this is update on violations. 
We have two on 65 Snow Inn and 22 Harbor Road. Yep. These are both floats on the marsh. So first for 65 Snow Inn. Um, I don't know if anybody is present remotely for this, but if you're for 65 Snow Inn, please speak up. I did not hear from them. Um, so we did send a violation <coughs> letter, and because we've done it in the past with this one, we also sent a fine. The float is to be removed by March 8th, 2022, someone or there would the, be additional fine. There might fine. be someone on now. Fine. Um, I think he's the next person. Okay. Um, so that's the update on that one. And then um, I believe Mr. Van Buren will be on for 22 Harbor Road. We did find um, floats on the intertidal area. They're owned both by himself and his neighbor, Mr. Manning. Um, we did not issue a violation, as we have not um, spoken with them before. So it was just um, really a warning and a request to get them removed by March 8th. Um, but I believe Mr. Van Buren has been speaking with Melissa and would probably like to speak with you folks about it. So Mr. Van Buren, if you'd like to. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Sheffield Van Puren at 22 Harbor Road. Uh, this is, uh, I've taken over the use of this property in the last few years. Uh, previously, it belonged to my grandfather. Oh, about six years ago, my father died and the house was in disrepair. And finally, a few years ago, it was <clears throat> ready to use. And uh, since the pandemic, we've been coming down off season and uh, I guess it was like two years ago, well, 20, we, we realized there were floats on the beach and I called Skipper Lee about it. I know he's on the call, so you might want to have him give you some background, but uh, so I called him and he says this was part for the course and I said, well, I was concerned that they were on the, too close to the marsh grass could have moved back. So Chris, um, he collapsed, was taken over from Skipper, and I called Chris, and, and he pulled the floats back, so it was at least on the flats, not on the marsh grass. And uh, then I got this notice. Uh, actually, the house is in trust by uh, the Cape Cod 5, and it, it's maintained for our use, but um, all of the actual ownership resides with the bank and um we're happy we're happy to remedy the situation we had no idea we were in violation uh i understood that this was just it, that this practice had been uh, maintained for the last 40 some years since todd Lee was around and um because when i was a kid the fishermen had a whole bunch of weirs uh, stuck over on the area that next to the yacht club, which I guess the town owns. The, so I, I didn't think twice about it. So, so but we're, we're I, the, I guess what I was thinking since the season's about to begin again, that we'd, we'd be happy to um, do whatever you want, but the easiest, of course, would just put the uh, floats back out in, into the harbor now, and then uh, next year have them hauled away. So, but we're waiting for guidance from you. So. Okay, um, thank you. I would say my recommendation under the circumstances, because it, their deadline, Mr. Van Buren's deadline, was also March eighth, and that you know a month later than that, we're getting into the season. That I mean, the most critical thing is to get them off the resource area. And I know Melissa spoke with him about. Um, it's not just the salt marsh, but it's the coastal beach too, and scraping that occurs with, with things. So, um, as long as you're not concerned about the ice um, and the floats, I think for this year it would be okay. I would recommend to the commission to let them put the floats back out to where they were, so they're not on the ground, and then work with his contractors to find out an upland solution for next year. Okay. Good. <laughs> And Thank I don't know if Skipper um, yeah. is wants to say anything, but if he's on. Skipper, any any comments? 
Um, no, the only thing that I would say is uh, I did notice that the uh, um, 65 Harbor Road, the floats had been taken off the marsh a couple of weeks ago and moved out to a mooring in the harbor um, to, to solve that issue. Um, okay. I yeah, I don't see any problem back, with the do docks back. But okay. All right, good. Well, I'll check that one. So, I mean, are, with respect to winter flounder, I mean, this is, we're coming up on the season for that? Yeah. I mean, is this? They're not, dred they're not dredging or doing pilings. Won't have any go. impact on that. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. No. Okay, good. Um, so, happy to, happy to work with you on a solution. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, we're happy to move them out and, uh, Happy to store them on site. I'll talk to Chris about where he would store them next year. Perfect. And he does have a location for that. So I think it's not a not a problem. All right. Great. Good. Thank you. So let, let me just and actually, ask, ask I just want to say one thing. We'll be thrilled to get them off there because visually they're kind of an eyesore. So <laughs> I am delighted to to have an excuse to watch the father feel. Appreciate the cooperation. Uh, let me just ask if there are any comments, questions from the commissioners on this issue. No, no? well, I don't think we need a motion on this. So everybody's uh, okay with letting them putting them back out in the water for now. Yep. It's okay. Alrighty, good. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, we appreciate you your much. your time. Thank you. That completes the agenda. Yeah. I any other comments, questions, updates, okay. stuff for you? Yep. Ready. Sure. Um, on March 7th, we are scheduled to go to the Board of Selectmen. I'm going to be chatting about um, the things that we want to do at Robbins Pond Conservation Area um, that we've wanted to do for a while now, which is prevent um, illegal usage that's happening out there. I can talk to you about it, Wayne. Um, <laughs> but the Selectmen, because one of our proposals was to... Um, put gates, um, not that would, that wouldn't block any homeowners who live nearby or anything, but put gates up so that people couldn't um, access, couldn't drive through the roads and then enter the property at um, areas we don't want them to enter, to enter into, do dumping, have fires, things like that. We have done a little bit of work out there, put up some, um, um, blockades, but not on the main road. Selectmen want to talk about talk about the gates with us, and uh, we have CPC money to do it. So, on March seventh, they would like um, me to come in, and you, you folks are welcome too. Um, at that time, because it's already going to be, we're already going to be there. I mentioned we could give them an update on the warrant articles if they wanted as well. Where is this um, Robbins Pond Conservation Area? Is this the Great Swamp property, it the is old Great bar? Swamp Pond. Okay, all right. Yeah. So <laughs> we've just had, um, and I did talk to the, the the neighbors up there, and they're in favor as long as they can still get into their properties. You know, in favor of all this because it, it's there can be a large amount of activity up there that's um, illegal at times. It's what so. young people do? <laughs> Not just young ones. <laughs> But, um, you know, it, it, if we have a fire in there, that's a huge issue. If we have a fire that gets out of control up there, it's a lot of trash that's starting to, um, especially in the, um, around the bogs. And the previous lessee was really helpful in kind of monitoring it and keeping people out. He no longer leases it. It's not his obligation. Um, I'm sure he still keeps an eye on things, though, um, living so close. But... Um, we really, this is a property we really need to start managing a little bit better. So that's our goal. Um, so March 7th, put it on your, your calendars, the meeting with the board. Um, we had a very successful work day with AmeriCorps um, last week where we finished cleaning um, the bogs with... Um, Sorry, the Bell's Neck Bogs, we've um, got the rest of the autumn olive and the gray willow out of the bogs that were starting to come in, left all the natives, um, but we were able to cut those back, DPW helped. Um, we also started 
clearing out the invasives near the herring run as well up by the fish ladder there. So that was, we've had, it's been busy, it's been good. Um, and we are going to have, I'm pleased to tell you about a scientific study that we've been asked to take part in at Thompson's Field. Um, they want to study the impacts, um, they meaning AmeriCorps has a grant to do a study on the impacts of our different ways of managing our land. Um, the cutting of the oaks, the recreation of the um, heathland, kind of we're going to incorporate a few different methodologies in doing so and study the effects of the different methodologies there. And, um, so I'd be interested to start that off. Good. Some recognition for the hard work you put in up there. It's fun work. <laughs> Um, and then I sent you a couple of announcements about um, webinars that are coming up. It's starting like late winter and early <coughs> spring is just class season. So if you're interested in doing them, I think all the ones I sent you were free. So, okay. all right. Any any resolution on the mechanicals and and bells like bugs, the pumps and stuff like that? Anything? No. No. No, I haven't heard anything from Bob either. Okay. I'll check with him uh -oh. again. Yeah, um, I, again, made it known to administration about that it can go out. Alan, um, maybe we can, somebody who knows the ins and outs of what the RFP should say, um, can hmm. I can work with them and just draft it and present it down to administration to see if they're okay with it so we can get this moving along. Good. What is this I uh, read in the note you put in the... Uh, Facebook the other on the internet about the hunting ban oh, and okay. Bells and Eck. What yeah. in God's name is that all about? <coughs> it's a citizen petition um, that a citizen of the town that you can you can put a warrant article in. Um, they want to prohibit hunting in the Bells Neck, kind of the Bells Neck proper, um, the con um, conservation area, and for the purpose because they say there's too many people <clears throat> that it's a hazard and also for wildlife so they're <coughs> presented that to the board of selectmen the land is under our care and custody so they'll be coming to the conservation commission on march 2nd march 2nd yep they're gonna come and present there is question first of all i mean I, and i spoke with i know the person and i spoke with them i said we need to look into or they need to, somebody needs to look into how the properties were acquired because a lot of them were taken by eminent domain, but a lot of them were sold um, to the town. And there's certain conditions, there's conservation restrictions on there. Um, so to change things, we, have, we just have to make sure legally everything is, is um, you know, you're able to do so if, if the commission should so want to. I, I kind of believe that it is not in the town meeting's power um, that it is the, the responsibility or the ability to change what happens out there lies with the Conservation Commission. Um, so, but we'll, that's my feeling on the matter. Legally, we'll get legal opinion from council about whether this is a really a town meeting matter or if it's a matter to be taken up at our level. I, I guess I assume from your comments, Amy, that no one has ever looked at any of the sales documents to determine whether there was any prohibition stated in those against hunting? I have. You have? Yeah. And there yeah. are or not? Um, there's, I haven't done them all, so I can't say I have the time to do them all. What I've come across so far is it really says it's for passive recreation. It does not go into the specifics yeah. of hunting. But again, there's I have not looked. There's about 10 parcels, and I haven't gotten through them all. Isn't uh, hunting under the uh, name of passive recreation? Yes. It always has been. Yes, it and generally is. Yeah, so what I'm just saying, it hasn't been, right. what I've seen so far, it doesn't go into specifics of saying yes hunting, no hunting. Yeah. On really, the ones I've seen. No, it, it falls under passive, so. Yeah, it generally falls under passive recreation. So if there was a restriction on the property that there could be a conservation restriction on these pro any of these properties that I haven't looked at yet, 
today that could be held by the Harvest Conservation Trust or something like that, there could be a prohibition on those pieces, but though, thus far I've not found any. Hmm. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, can we have a motion to adjourn? All move that we adjourn. I'll second it. Roll call. Mark? Aye. Good night. Good night. Aye. Alan? Aye. Good night. John? Aye. And good night. Brad? Aye. Thank you and good night. Okay. Jim? Aye. I'm an aye, so we're, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good luck. <laughs> and that's the way it was. Two things for you two. Okay. Oh, that's right.